from the high desert in the great American Southwest. I bid you all good evening and good morning, as the case may be across all these many time zones, stretching from the Tahitian and Hawaiian island chains all the way eastward to the Caribbean, in the U.S. Virgin Islands, south into South America, north well to the pole, the magnetic north pole, and worldwide, of course, on the Internet, this is Coast to Coast AM. I'm Art Bell. Hi. We are going to go venturing into a world this morning bigger than you could possibly imagine. It is kind of like outer space, travel in outer space, except it's not. It's travel into inner space. We're going to do a program this morning on something called nanotechnology. Machines, I said machines, with moving parts so small that with the naked eye you could not possibly see them or discern their operation. Uh, my guest uh, is a man I had on about a year and a half ago, uh, Charles Osman, and I'll tell you more about Charles in a moment. And oh, by the way, guess what, folks? The first crop circle of the year, as you know, uh, has already occurred. And guess, guess who has a photograph? <laughs> um, so if you want to go up to the website and take a look, and it really is neat. Because, of course, the crop is new, so it's green. This crop circle uh, occurred instead of uh, in mature wheat or something uh, in a green field. And it is beautiful. And, of course, it's on the website, which is where you should be. That would be www.artbell.com. www.artbell.com. It is beginning early this year, indicating, no doubt, there's going to be a lot of crop circles. What are crop circles? Well, I don't know. You tell me. A lot of people think they are fractal. Uh, particularly the more uh, 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 complex ones, uh, like Stonehenge, with 191 circles, and that they are either a message or have meaning. Nobody really knows what they are, but they certainly are, and they are not the product of Doug and Dave with the board and some chains tromping about. So you go take a look at the first crop circle of the year. It's on the website now. Now, Nanotechnology. What in the world is that? I've got a man who knows. His name is Charles Osprey. I had him on the air, I'm going to guess, about a year, year and a half ago. He is a member of the Science Advisory Board of NanoThink. <laughs> NanoThink. A privately funded nanotechnology think tank and development research uh, uh, facilitation for a consulting group. He's also a senior fellow of the Foresight Institute. That's not Farsight, Foresight, folks. A senior fellow of the Institute for Global Futures, currently the science editor and author for Mondo 2000 magazine. I'm sure you've heard of that. Technical editor and author for Midnight Engineering and contributing editor, author, of Robotics Digest. He's also a, um, a currently uh, authoring a piece for the IEEE Spectrum on the topic of biomolecular nanocomputing systems and devices. Good Lord. Uh, that has a kind of an interesting connotation to it. Charles, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. You uh, really have your plate kind of full there, don't you? And it's brimming over, but in a way, this is a very good metaphor to symbolically represent the world we're about to be thrust into, uh, very much in kind of the same way that you depicted this process that you refer to as the quickening, mm -hmm. where the compression in the temporal domain, I'm looking at compression and convergence in the functionality domain. Meaning, uh, that, that's a big mouthful. Uh, I take that to mean a compression and convergence of... Uh, a very wide plethora of different types of industries, scientific disciplines, and even socioeconomic systems, which up until fairly recently were still relatively autonomous, self-contained process engines that would 
produce some kind of product, service, and or scientific uh, discipline-oriented uh, results uh, as part of a development stream that resided within their own autonomous realm. That does not exist anymore. Everything is becoming ever more interconnected. Interconnected, so yes. That's correct. And this process is being driven by this connectivity grid, which we now call the Internet. And I date back to the very early days. I, I'm an old uh, crusty fellow. I date back to uh, quite a few decades ago, really, back in the National Lab System, when the Internet then was developed for the National Lab System as nothing right. more than a communication network. Correct. It's gone far beyond that. And yet, even back in those early days, there were a few... Uh, what were considered perhaps uh, on the fringe kind of people that speculated at some threshold moment in time. Mm -hmm. The connectivity factor went up to about where it is now. Everything would be uh, poised at a, almost like, like a cliff, if you will, where the rate of change and the volume of change processes would simultaneously converge so that every technology is interconnected to every other technology. And that's I, would like to, I would like to get a, your thoughts, if I could, on the Internet itself, uh, okay. where it has gone, where it presently is, and where it's going, and what it means for society. Uh, what are your thoughts on oh, it? Oh, I have the I, I wonderful you should ask this. And, I, and I'll start by saying approximately two years ago, I wrote a paper, a technical thesis, a refereed paper called The Internet of an Organism, which I submitted to the... European Society of Artificial Intelligence and Cybernetics, and they have their annual uh, conference in Austria. Uh, to my astonishment, they not only published the paper, which was no small feat itself, but when I got back to proceedings, of roughly about a third of the other participants, most of whom were professors from various universities around the world, uh, India, uh, former Soviet Union, all over Europe, the United States, Canada, etc., had very similar ideas. They were using terms like the global Gaia being encapsulated in this synthetic neural net engine, you know, things that really would have sounded completely uh, off the grid to most folks, but to me it made perfectly good sense. And I thought, okay, here we are, a bunch of different people in different parts of the planet, but we had a very, very similar uh, vision of how this process is evolving. And therefore, I submit to you the following idea, that an organism in itself is self-correcting, self-modifying, it grows, it adapts, it will, at a certain point, spawn you know, offspring of sorts, mm -hmm. and that's what you have going on in the Internet now. You have a hopefully benign, but what I see to be an involuntary symbiosis between the human species and this connectivity system, which in fact does have self-modifying, self-correcting properties. You already have companies like NTT and ATT developing neural net-driven and even genetic algorithm-driven routing structures to optimize performance in the peak load pattern sets. Oh, well, hold on. You're getting ahead of the average person out there. Okay, well, I'll, um, I'll back away. Back, back away a little bit. Uh, right, you I'll, said, uh, with regard to the Internet, Hopefully, okay. hopefully, benign. Yes. Now, and that, I, that indicates to me you're not sure. Well, and no one is. It's all a matter of ratios of probability. And I, in the book that I'm currently working on, I study this problem rather carefully. I have a whole series of sort of what I call option graphs. that say, under these criteria, this potential series of outcomes could arise. And I want to offer the following thing. The fact that we are heading into an enormous change is, in fact, absolutely the, the way it is. Some people look at prophecy and talk about some sort of calamity due to a mm -hmm. huge commerce. And some people talk about a spiritual calamity. Some mm -hmm. people talk about huge weather changes and so forth. I actually don't focus on that at all. But what I do focus on is a socioeconomic upheaval on a scale never before experienced in human history. There's going to be a mantle of chaos that this process, this convergence and this quickening will sort of come up against. It'll be like a barrier. It'll be like the next evolutionary test, if you will. And if we, as an organism, uh, can successfully negotiate this test, we'll come through it as a more robust organism with a more robust society as a process. If we fail, we'll be sort of mired in our own socioeconomic chaos, and we're about two, three, maybe five years now away from that horizon. Are you, are you familiar with Michael Crichton's theory uh, about the Internet? Yes, and in fact, I understand what he's getting at. His basic theorem is that just as you have biodiversity in an ecosystem to make a more robust ecosystem, you should have behavioral diversity or cultural diversity to maintain the health of the society. Very good. And, that, that, that it will squash diversity. And I understand this. I mean, before the Internet days, people would travel around the, the world. They'd, Americans would go somewhere else abroad, and they'd see an Americanization of some autonomous nation state that used to have its own separate little culture. And it, it would be like, like a flattening out of the uniqueness of where they had just gone to. That's like the organic version of what Michael is now referring to in this, what I call the virtual terraform. But that may or may not be the case. 
there are quite a few variables. It's like a, uh, a, a node on a decision tree, mm -hmm. and which branch gets activated, I think, relies upon a very complex set of conditions leading to that node occurs. But I want to offer one more thought here. That is that what the Internet is doing now is only a precursor to what's about to happen. Well, tell us. Because I visualize a realm in where experiential conveyance becomes the methodology by which education, marketing, the interaction between other people throughout the world. Right now we have something called Vermal, which is a virtual reality modeling language that allows you to have interactive 3D environments come through the wire and appear on your computer screen or right. release that. Right. And it's still very primitive, very crude. A bunch of my friends who are part of the technical community are right at the very forefront of creating these things. But I see it as a blink in the eye. It's a little niche because... What you're, I think what you're saying, let me try and... Uh, sure. I've got to stop you, otherwise you're going to race ahead of the audience. But you <laughs> seem to be trying to say that there's going to be uh, an Internet or what is going to be whatever grows I into the Internet, what, right. what, what it's going to be, and a connection, a biological direct connection to human beings. A, not only biological in the physical sense, but also in the mental sense. In the, here's what, I, another, what I'm about to try to explain, is the concept of synthetic sentience as an engineerable, deliverable commodity. Oh, brother. And as a matter of fact, we, if you want to look at socioeconomic system paradigms, we are sh shifting, even now as we speak, away from a hard asset-based commodity-driven system. Doesn't that drive us toward a, a single consciousness, though, that will make us, to use a Star Trekism, Borg-like? Um, in a sense, that is one of the possible options, and that's why this is a test. Every time the human species, and I think this has happened many times in many other worlds throughout the known universe, I think this is a very common rote series of processes that any organism would go through, the intelligent organism. So here we've climbed this ladder. As we get to these rungs, which are ever more closely spaced, by the way, the risk-gain ratio volume of that rung mm. provides us the potential of traumatic failure or the potential of spectacular growth. And each one is an increment larger than the one before. I mean, we've already survived global warfare, global nuclear warfare, mm -hmm. the coin is still being flipped as to whether or not we suppress the biosphere's capacity to support life beyond what it is now, and I think, you know, the bets are still off on that one. But racing up along this is the essence that we have the potential of utilizing this experiential conveyance engine mm. as, a methodo as, a method uh, as a methodology for enhancing one's educational potential. And let me see if I can communicate what I'm trying to say here. I first saw the most compelling version of virtual reality quite a few years ago, not with goggles and gloves and trying to shoot at something like you've seen in arcade. No, that's done. That's stupid. That's what. What I saw was the following: a friend of mine who unfortunately passed away. His dream was to capture the great archaeological sites throughout the world, especially ones which are trapped in politically difficult circumstances, like Baalbek in Iraq or Angkor Wat in Cambodia, sure. and or many of the sites that are now. Uh, crumbling away because of heat and uh, an explosion of pollution, that sort of thing. The point is that by capturing these things and making these very elaborate virtual models, you can then not only preserve them, but allow the community around the world to visit the same site and have the same experience. But more importantly, the efficiency by which that experience is conveyed cannot be matched by any other medium. And here's the proof. I went to Brazil as part of an international virtual reality consortia demonstration. This was well, about five, six years ago, actually. And here I was on stage in downtown Rio. And he, this fellow had dragged along his Everson Sutherland supercomputer, this huge, enormous box. He was heading out of this place with called a Lee helmet. And we had people coming up on stage from all walks of life, all genders, young kids, old folks, people that drove cats for a living, college professors, you know, many of whom didn't speak English at all. They could put on that helmet, uh -huh. and suddenly they were inside a 5,000-year-old African city called Wuhan, which at that time was the capital of the, the, the Nubian Empire, which is now the Sudan. In other words, unless you were a professional archaeologist that could go to some obscure library and find the right book and read about it, you would never even know this place existed, let alone have a sense for who these people were, the culture, the... the